Hello, it's Professor Gray here with you. Welcome back, everyone. It's time for another week of TOEFL, our practical English class. I hope you uh, have had a good, or you had a good weekend. And uh, wow, it's week eight, which means we're almost to the midterm test. Can you believe it? <laughs> time really does fly. I, I can never get over how fast the semesters seem to fly by. Um, so, as you know, um, well, I sent you uh, uh, an email last week with some information uh, about the upcoming midterm test. That'll be next week during your regular class time. And <clears throat> I will send you the test online. It'll be just a reading test only, not listening. Uh, the plan is definitely to meet uh, in class for the final exam. Right now, uh, I've talked to people here at the school and it looks pretty much 100%. So I'm planning to give you an in-class test uh, in December. Now we'll talk about that more later. But right now the midterm, again, reading questions only, and it will focus on the first four chapters of the reading section, one, two, three, and four. Now, you should review what we've learned. We're c carrying on with our study, of course, but for the midterm test, you should be reviewing the first four. Uh, most of the passages I send you will be new, passages you haven't seen before. Um, there'll be approximately four or five passages on the midterm test, and about one of them will be a passage you've read in the book, but have a few different questions. Uh, the others will be new, but they will be you know, similar style and also they will focus on the first four question types from the first four units. So definitely spend some time reviewing the strategies, the question types, uh, and, and the passages, because as I said, there will be at least one passage on the test that you have already read in the textbook. Okay, um, it, I'm not sure exactly yet, but it'll take somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes. So I'll send you a uh, uh, an email with the test and an answer key. You will have a specific amount of time that I'll tell you to finish it and send me your answers. You can send the answers on the answer key that I send you, or you can just write them directly on the email. That's up to you, but I must receive them by a certain time. If you're late, up to five minutes late, you lose 20% of your score. Uh, after that, you just get a zero. So timing is everything. It's very, very important. All right, uh, if you have any questions about the midterm test, of course, uh, you can email me and ask me questions. Again, this week, regular class right here, regular homework by Thursday afternoon, and then next week, there will be no video lecture next week. It'll be just a live uh, online uh, midterm uh, test that you have to, you have to take. Okay, uh, let's get to work, everyone. Uh, your homework began on page 53. Okay, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, we are looking at uh, skill five here, which is um, details, finding factual information. Um, and the first one are, I guess you can say positive facts. Later today, we'll look at negative facts, but let's get to that after we review <clears throat> the two uh, homework passages. Clovis culture. This is about archaeology, I guess, uh, Gogo, Gogohak. And archaeologist is uh, like a Gogohaksa, like a person who specializes in archaeology. Uh, it's a little bit confusing here, maybe, because uh, New Mexico. Now, New Mexico is not part of Mexico. It's part of the United States. New Mexico is one state. The U.S. has 50 states. One of them is New Mexico, and it's a different country than Mexico. It's the U.S., but it's right next to Mexico. It's on the border of the U.S. and Mexico. It can be a little bit confusing. I agree. Uh, so they found these tools in 1932, discovered, found them, and they're quite sophisticated. Sophisticated means... Um, very advanced, sort of modern for its time, okay? So not sophisticated today, but 12,000 years ago, it was very sophisticated. 
and they're unlike any tools that have been found in the old world. Old world, remember, refers to uh, not the Western Hemisphere, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, number 11, Clovis tools date from A. They date from, they come from. Dating from, coming from uh, this time, this year, this point in history. Uh, 10,000 BC, A. 10,000 BC is exactly 12,000, not exactly, but 12,000 years ago. We're roughly 2,000 now, plus 2,000, and then minus 10,000, 10 plus 2 equals 12,000 years ago. Uh, number 12, the town of Clovis is not in Mexico. It's in New Mexico, which is in the United States. D, this is where the remnants of an ancient culture uh, were found. Remnants, again, what remains, right? Remnants can be uh, like bones and teeth from a dead animal or the, you know, what's left in your coffee or tea uh, at the end after you drink it, the little... Uh, you know, powdery remains, that's, that's kind of a remnant. And here it's, it's um, artifacts, Art uh, yumul, I think in Korean, the closest world is, word is yumul. Uh, artifact, uh, something man-made. Artifact literally means man-made or hand-made. And these uh, artifacts are things that are found that are man-made. Uh, bowls or spoons or knives or jewelry, that kind of thing. Uh, anything man-made are, in this case, artifacts and remnants of an early culture. Number 13, also from paragraph one, um, the tools were sophisticated, C, rather advanced, very uh, modern and advanced or cutting edge for their time. Number 13A is the opposite. Rudimentary means uh, simple or basic. So really, it's the opposite of uh, sophisticated. 13 is C. Uh, paragraph two, in the years since the first tools of this sort were discovered. Of this sort, this kind, this type, uh, tools like these were discovered in New Mexico. They found other tools ranging from Mexico to Montana. Montana, that's where my family lives. Uh, it's in the north. It, on the Canadian border. It's quite far from New Mexico. And Nova Scotia, wow, that's very far. That's out farthest east you can go uh, in Canada. It's, it's, uh, Nova Scotia is near uh, New England or uh, in, uh, in the United States, not too far from Boston. Um, and that's very, very far. So what is this showing us? Number 14 is B, that the Clovis expanded, spread out, relatively quickly. Now, with these questions, again, you need to focus on looking for synonyms and restatements. In the paragraph, it says, uh, the Clovis spread rapidly, spread out, uh, expanded, okay, like a balloon, rapidly, quickly, relatively quickly throughout North America. Number 14 is B. 15, the last one, par uh, paragraph three, look at line two. They traveled in groups of 40 to 50 individuals, uh, migrating seasonally and returning to the same hunting camps each year. Migrating means moving, like immigrate, immigration, migration, migratory, uh, animals like birds and uh, whales. So many animals are migratory, they, they move north or south, depending on the, the, the climate, of course, the, the weather. And so, and so do nomadic people. These are what we call nomadic or nomads, uh, yumongmin. Yumongmin, nomad, uh, nomadic people moving with the, uh, with the seasons. And so number 15 is D, summers and winters in different places means migrating seasonally. Migrating seasonally means literally you know, go south for the winter, go north for the summer, that sort of thing, like birds. <coughs> all right. Okay, that's all for the Clovis culture. That one's quite interesting. I enjoyed that one a lot. Oh, oh, passage four, guess what? It's time for us to go up into the heavens again, as always, or it seems like every week we have at least one passage that talks about um, uh, uh, astronomy. 
talks about you know, stars and planets and the sky and so on. And here it is, brown dwarfs. Nanjingi? Hmm. Well, Nanjingi, yeah, dwarf, but this is a brown dwarf in the sky. A celestial body, celeste. Remember, celestial means in the sky. C-E-L comes from the Latin word for sky. Uh, has never quite become a star. Typical brown dwarf has a mass, okay, a size that is 8% or less than that of the sun, much smaller than the sun. 8%, much smaller than the mass of the sun. A, 16 is A. Uh, the mass of a brown dwarf is too small to generate the internal temperature capable of igniting, uh, igniting the nuclear burning, like igniting means starting a fire, uh, when you turn on your car, that's called an ignition because you're little, literally sparking, sparking it with a little fire. Uh, burning of hydrogen to release energy and light. Uh, brown dwarf contracts at a steady rate, constant, regular, continuous rate, steady, like a steady beat in music. After it is contracted as much as possible, as much as possible, um, its emission of light uh, it, sorry, it begins to cool off. Now, when does it cool off? After it is contracted as much as possible. That means maximum. Finished. No more. 17B, complete. As much as possible means the maximum or the finished amount. It's complete. Number 18, uh, cooled off for 2 to 3 billion years. Um, after a period of two to three billion years, it, its emission is of light is so weak, it can be difficult to observe from Earth. Observe C. So its emission of light, it's sending out light, but very weak light. So it's almost impossible for us to see it from Earth. A, number 18, A. Notice the synonyms here. Notice the restatements. It's weak light makes it difficult to see, to observe from Earth. That's really the key here. You know, when you take TOEFL, you really have to train yourself and practice looking for synonyms. That, maybe that's the number one thing for TOEFL. Look for synonyms, look for restatements. Uh, and also that's a great way to improve your vocabulary. Your vocabulary, your reading skills, everything. But synonyms and restatements are so, so important in TOEFL, both the reading and the listening part. Just remember, it's a difficult test. The answer isn't gonna say the exact same words as what's in the passage. It'll be a restatement of those words. Number 19, uh, paragraph three. Um, let's look at line uh, three. A brown dwarf is quite distinctive Distinctive means, notice, distinguished, okay? It can be easily distinguished, separated. You can tell the difference. You can distinguish A from B. You can separate or uh, they are distinctive. They are different, clearly different or able to separate them. Uh, its surface temperature is relatively cool and because it's internal composition, what it's made of inside, composed of, made of inside approximately 75% hydrogen. That's the key, 19 is C. 75% is three quarters, exactly. A little bit of math here. Three quarters of the core, the internal, uh, internal um, uh, composition. Again, look for these synonyms. Find the, find the, uh, the sentence, find the place in the passage that talks about the question and look for synonyms. Uh, core internal composition, three quarters hydrogen, 75% hydrogen. Number 20, <clears throat> white dwarf. Well, it talks about white dwarfs from the next sentence. A white dwarf in contrast, opposite, different, has gone through a long period when it burns hydrogen, followed by another long period in which it burns the helium created by the burning of hydrogen, it ends up with a core that consists mostly of oxygen and carbon and a thin layer of hydrogen. So all that hydrogen is gone. And now the core is mostly oxygen and carbon 
it is no longer mostly hydrogen, 75%, no longer. No longer mostly hydrogen. In other words, no longer D, predominantly hydrogen, predominantly mostly. See how they connect here. Always look for synonyms to help you out. No longer predominantly hydrogen. It's no longer uh, mostly hydrogen. It's mostly carbon and uh, oxygen. Number 21, uh, brown dwarfs. It is not always as easy, however, to distinguish, separate or uh, um, dis uh, sep uh, distinguish between the two, see the difference between the two. Brown dwarfs from large planets. Planets are not formed in the same way as brown, dwar brown dwarfs. They may in their current state have some of the same characteristics. C, 21 is C. Share some similarities, share some characteristics, have some of the same characteristics. 22, uh, Jupiter. The planet Jupiter, for uh, example, is the largest planet in our solar system with a mass 317 times that of our planet, Earth. 317 times the mass of Earth. Wow. Earth seems relatively small now, doesn't it? Resembles a brown dwarf in that it radiates energy based on its internal energy. Okay. Resembles a brown dwarf in that, in this way. 22 is D. It is in at least one way. In that way, in this way, in one respect in one style, in one way, in one uh, pattern, whatever. In one way, in one respect. Uh, similar to a brown dwarf. Again, notice it's a restatement. Sometimes you have to read carefully to notice the restatement, but it's there, it's always there. All right, that's brown dwarfs. Good work, everyone. Any questions, of course, please ask. A lot of you had some good questions last week, thank you. Please keep them coming. Quite a few of you asked me some really good questions uh, from the work in last week's uh, homework and video. Skill six, negative facts. Now, these are the most difficult and the easiest at the same time, I think. The questions themselves are not difficult. What's difficult is that it's very easy to be confused and to make a mistake. Today, when you practice, I want you to go slowly. Give yourself a very good um, pattern for these. Don't rush these in the practice. When we do our review exercise, yeah, then go faster. Go faster, get them right, answer them well, because you have created a good pattern, a good strategy, a good way to answer these. What is the way? When you see that big word, not, N-O-T, or except, big letters, stop, Okay, that tells you right there, you have to switch your brain. Instead of looking for a right answer, you're looking for a wrong answer. Wrong is right, right is wrong. That's it. Stop, think, change your focus. You're taking a, a test, a TOEFL test. You're nervous, sweating, breathing heavily. Oh, TOEFL, uh, what am I doing? Okay, I, you're doing what a test taker does. You're looking for the right answer. That's your job. But here the right answer is the wrong answer. That's very counterintuitive. It is very easy to make a mistake. You quickly read it, quickly answer. Oh, A is right, A is right, yeah, right, A, good, move on. Time, time, go, go, go. But you got it wrong. Because in your mind, you're trained yourself correctly to look for the right answers. Stop, take a breath, think. Wrong is right, right is wrong, okay? Give yourself like two or three seconds to just make your brain ready for it, then answer the question. And when we practice, go through each one. Make a habit of A, B, C, D. Right, right, wrong, right. Ah, wrong is right, C. A, B, C, D, wrong, right, right, right. Wrong is right, A, like this. Do it like a military drill, get, Get yourself into a good rhythm and a good strategy and a good pattern for answering these questions. Then you'll build up speed later. If you do that, you're so much more likely to get them right. 
Let's take a look. Moon bows. Um, okay, number one. According to the paragraph one, it is not true that you can see a rainbow when. Okay, wrong is right. Right is wrong. You can see a rainbow when the sun is low in the sky behind you and it is raining ahead of you. Okay, 1A, the sky is low in the sky. The sun is low in the sky. Yes, right. B, the sun is in front of you. No, it's behind you. Yes, no. C, it's raining in front of you. Raining ahead of you, in front of you. Yes, the sun's rays are reflected off the raindrops. Later on, it says that, and I think we know that forms a rainbow. Number one, yes, no, yes, yes, right, wrong, right, right, B. B is wrong, so B is right. Number two, <clears throat> it is not indicated in paragraph two. Let's look. Moon bows are far less common than our rainbows, but they are formed in much the same way. They require a very specific set of circumstances to occur, to happen. When they do occur, when they do happen, they occur just after a full moon, okay, a moon at its brightest, okay, full moon, big, full moon, once a month, more or less, uh, has risen in the east, and just after the sun has set in the west. So the sun has just set, has gone down, the moon has just risen, come up. Sun just went down, the moon just came up. And it's raining uh, in the west. A moon bow may be visible to you if you are facing west and the moon is behind you. So the moon takes the place of the sun. That's all, right? The, the light of the sun reflects off the raindrops, causing the rainbow. Here, now it's the light of the bright uh, full moon just coming up over the horizon in the east. A, where the moon must be in the sky for a moon bow to occur. Yes, in the east right on the horizon. At what time of day? Yes, sunset. Sunset is a time of day. It's one time of day. Yes. See which direction you must be facing. You must be facing what? I'm doing this because that's actually west. I'm looking west out of our classroom window. So west. Yes. And D, which parts of the world? No, it doesn't say that. True, 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 false. Yes, 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 no. D is the answer. Okay, give yourself again. Don't rush the practice today. Make a good, uh, a good pattern for yourself. As always, page 58 and the, uh, and the introduction, please read it. Page 58, notice that it is not stated, not mentioned, not discussed. When you see those capital letters, stop, take a breath, switch your brain around. Yes is no, no is yes, right is wrong, wrong is right. Then answer the question and do it methodically, right? The, if you do that, these are really not that difficult. The difficult thing is to not get confused. All right, let's try one, flatfish. Oh, wow, flatfish. You know, I, I, had, a, I had some really delicious hue with a friend of mine about a week ago, and we ate um, uh, guangla. I love guangla, guangla is really delicious. I kind of feel guilty now. Hmm. Because I, they're talking about these beautiful fish, and I ate them. <laughs> I ate them quite often. Anyway, go ahead and do flatfish. Answer number one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, you know, try to finish in around five minutes or so. But if you need more time, go ahead. Remember, take your time and go methodically and carefully, and let's see if you get get them all right. Go ahead. <clears throat> Members of the flatfish family, sand dabs and flounders, have an evolutionary advantage evolving, changing over, over time. Many colorfully decorated ocean neighbors in that they are able to adapt, change, adjust their body coloration to different environments. Number one, uh, sand dabs are a type of flat, flatfish. Yes, same family as flounders. Yes, they've evolved, evolutionary, yes. Colorfully decorated? No, they're not colorfully decorated. Their neighbors are colorfully decorated. They're not. You've seen flatfish. You've seen guanga, uh, probably. They're, they're not really actually that colorful or beautiful. I said beautiful earlier. I guess they're beautiful because they taste so good. But anyway, their color is not, they're not colorful. D, A, B, C, D, true, 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 false. 
D is wrong, so D is right. Number two, sand dabs and flowers. These aquatic chameleons, chameleon, just like in, uh, in Korean, you use the same word, like the lizard changes color. Aquatic means in the ocean, in the sea. Aqua means water, like Aquarius or aquarium. Uh, flattened bodies, they're flat. Mm -hmm. Well suited to life along the ocean floor. They live on the floor of the ocean in the shallow areas of the continental shelf that they inhabit, that they live in, inhabitant, all right? They inhabit the floor of the continental shelf. Two, flattened bodies, A, yes. Live on the ocean floor, yes. Live in the deepest part, no. They live in the shallow continental shelf. D, continental shelf, yes. True, true, false, true. Right, right, wrong, right, C. Continental shelf is the shallow area um, next to continents of the ocean, very shallow. It used to be uh, land, and then when the sea levels rose, uh, you know, after the ice age, the glaciers melted, glaciers, Pingha, they melted and this, the oceans came up, and now what was land is now uh, underwater, but very shallow, not deep. We call it the continental shelf. In the U.S., it's uh, east coast, uh, not on the west coast. Where I'm from on the west coast, it's just deep, right? The ocean just goes straight down, basically. In Korea, I think it's similar, but opposite. Uh, the east coast of Korea, there's no continental shelf. It's just ocean. Uh, the west coast is very shallow. Sometimes there's even no water. Um, the shelf is much, much higher. Uh, there is a continental shelf on the west. So anyway, that's the continental shelf. Number three, um, they have remarkably sensitive color vision that registers, that notices the subtlest gradations, the smallest changes on the sea bottom and the sea life around them, surroundings. Number three, A. Sensitive to light, no. Able to see colors, yes. That's why they change color. Able to see the sea bottom, sure, they live on the sea bottom and they can see it and they can also, you know, they notice, they register, they see the subtle gradations, the tiny changes. Register C, C colors, yes. C, the sea bottom, yes. Aware of their surroundings, the sea life around them, surroundings, yes. Three, A, wrong, B, right, C, right, D, right, A. Number four, next one. Um, chromatophores are pigment-carrying skin cells. Okay, number four, they're skin cells, yes, and they carry pigments, yes. And these chromatophores are able to accurately reproduce not only the colors, but also the texture of the ocean floor. So they adapt to the colors, they change according to colors. They don't change the ocean floor, of course not. No, the, the fish doesn't change the floor. The way the floor looks and the texture, that changes the fish. The fish changes itself to look like the floor. D is opposite, really. Number four, A, B, C, right, 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 wrong. D is wrong, D is right, number four, D. Number five, um, last sentence here. Each time that a sand dab or a flounder finds itself in a new environment, uh, moves to a new area, new place, the pattern on the body of the fish adapts to fit in with the color and the texture around it. So what do they do? They move to new environments, yes. Finds itself in a new environment, moves to a new environment, A, yes. B, adapt their behavior, they don't change behavior, no. C, change color, yes. Adapt to textures around them, yes. A, yes, B, no. C, yes, D, yes. B, number five, B. Pretty amazing, not only do they change their color, but the, the texture, so they look like the rocks or the sand or whatever's around them. Nature never ever ceases to amaze me. Limestone caves, uh, passage two. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Limestone caves, uh, it's a little longer. Take a little more time if you need it. When you're done, come back. But remember, go slowly and carefully and let's get a perfect score here if we can. Go ahead. Limestone caves can be spectacular structures filled with great stalactites, and coming down, and stalagmites, 
uh, on the floor coming up. Form one rainwater, which is a weak acid, dissolves calcite or lime out of limestone. Uh, over time, the lime-laden water, laden means holding or carrying. Lime-laden water, filled with lime, having a lot of lime, carrying a lot of lime. Number six is C. Uh, the lime evaporates. Um, no, the lime, does, the lime in the water does not evaporate. Uh, it's the water that evaporates. Rainwater dissolves lime out of limestone. The lime-laden water drips down into the cracks, enlarging them into caves. Then some of the lime is redeposited to form the stalactites and stalagmites. Now, the point here is the water is filled with lime. The water evaporates, goes away, and the lime stays, and it starts to form the uh, formations inside the cave. Water evaporates, lime does not evaporate. It stays and forms these, these structures. C. Uh, paragraph two, stalactites grow down from cave ceilings, uh, are formed in limestone caves when groundwater containing dissolved lime drips from the roof of the cave and leaves a thin deposit as it evaporates. Stalactites generally grow only a fraction of an inch, tiny little bit, each year. But over time, a considerable number, many, 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 considerable means a lot, many, may grow to be several yards long, several meters long. <clears throat> number seven, A, they don't enlarge. Enlarge means make bigger. They don't. They don't make the ceiling bigger. A is wrong. B, so A is right. A, they are found in limestone caves, yes. They grow downward, yes, from the ceiling down and they grow quite slowly, a fraction of an inch, less than an inch, maybe a centimeter or so each year, each year very slowly. A no, B yes, C yes, D yes, A. Um, in cases where the supply of water is seasonal, one season only has rain. So you have a rainy season and a dry season. So the water is seasonal. You only get it you know, half the year or one season of the year. Um, they may actually have growth rings resembling those on tree trunks that show you uh, how old the stalactites are. You know, a tree trunk, you cut a tree and you count the circles, each one is a year. Well, it could be similar. They have little rings like one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Number eight is D. It doesn't say anything about how they disappear, what causes them to disappear. A yes, B yes, C yes, limited water supply, uh, seasonal. C water is just seasonal, limited, only one time a year. And D no, 8D. Uh, number nine, stalagmites are formed on the floor of a limestone cave when water containing dissolved lime has dripped either from the cave ceiling or from the stalactite above it hanging down from the cave ceiling. They develop in the same way as stalactites when water containing dissolved limestone evaporates. In some limestone caves with mature limestone development, older, mature means older development, longer time, uh, stalactites and stalagmites grow together, causing limestone pillars that stretch from the cave floor to the cave ceiling. This is a pillar. You have stalactites coming down, stalagmites coming up, and then sometimes they connect and form what's called a pillar. Number nine is C. Stalagmites are below stalactites from the floor, not the ceiling. So it's wrong. So it's right. A, S, B, S, C, no, D, S, C. And number 10, D. Uh, a, yes, result when they grow together. B, yes, they're attached to the floor and the ceiling. C, yes, are relatively aged or mature, older. D, no, they don't mention anything. It might be true, I don't know, but it does not talk about D, therefore D is the right answer. The right answer is either not stated or it's not true. Okay? With these questions, look for something not stated or not true. All right, now the homework, again, we will check in two weeks. Um, no, let me restate that. I need you to email me this week and do it. I will review it in two weeks. You still must finish the homework 
by Thursday. Finish the video, finish the homework, send me your, your work, your question, not your work, your questions and your time for one passage by Thursday. Uh, I will review it in two weeks because next week is the midterm test. Passage three, Wrigley's chewing gum. Please do that one. Passage four, dissociative identity disorder. Please do that one. Complete passages three and four. And then do the first review exercise only. John Muir. This is a long one. This is pretty tough. Page 63, John Muir. And uh, questions 1 through 13, page 64, 65. So your homework begins on page 61, ends on page 65. For the John Muir article only, tell me your time. Try to finish in 20 minutes. John Muir and 13 questions. 13 times 1.5 is basically 20 minutes, okay? Passages three and four, take your time, go slowly, develop a pattern, practice it well, get your strategy down well. Then, uh, reading exercise, uh, John Muir, time yourself, try to finish in 20 minutes or less and tell me your time in your email this week. Okay? Uh, at page 65, then stop. Um, yeah, on page 66, we're going to do that next week. You don't have to, or sorry, in two weeks. After the midterm, we will begin with uh, page 66. Okay, good work. Time for us to look at reading. Uh, sorry, listening, listening. Let's go to the listening part. Homework, passages three and four on page 145 to 147. Let's take a look. Page 145, zoology, must be an animal, Z-O-O, -O, zoo, animals, the opossum. And of course, the opossum is indeed an animal. Uh, while we, we review this, you can look on page 587 and see, uh, you can look at, you can at, listen again. You have the listening file from last week, um, or uh, you can read the script on page 587, 588. Uh, it's up to you how you want to do it. The next animal we need to discuss is the opossum. It's another kind of marsupial. Oh no, I think we're supposed to know what that is. Oh, when somebody says, oh no, something's wrong. We, we're supposed to know that. It means I don't know that. It doesn't mean we all don't know that. It means we are supposed to know it, but I don't know it. She can only speak for herself. She's saying, I don't know what a marsupial is, D. She does not know what it is, but thinks she should. Yes, we are supposed to know what that is. I don't know what that is. A marsupial is an animal that carries its young in a pouch, like a kangaroo. That's marsupial. Ah. And young opossums stay in their mother's pouch for what? A few days? For what? Is this right? Is this right? Am I right? few days? No, not exactly. Not exactly right. You're not exactly right. You're not exactly A. Correct. Number 11 is A. Not exactly means not exactly right. Not exactly correct. Number 12. So young opossums spend the first two months in their mother's pouch and um, the next two months hanging on her back. You've got it. To get something is to understand it. Oh, I get it. I understand. Did you get that? Did you understand that? You got it. You understood it. You understand well. C. That's right. Number 12 is C. And number 13. Uh, remember, I've told you a couple times, when you hear a mistake, it's not an accident. It's on purpose. I don't think opossums that played it. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it is. B. Maybe it is. Reconsidering, changing, thinking again. Uh, let me think about that again. Let me change that. Let me reconsider, think again, be. So that's right. Yeah, opossum uh, carries, uh, the mother carries the baby in a pouch. That's a marsupial. Opossums, kangaroos, I guess wombats do as well. Wallabies. Quite a few animals in Australia do, I believe. Um, in English, sometimes we say you're playing possum when you're pretending to be asleep or dead or not understanding. 
You know, when a, a teacher is like, okay, show me your homework, please. Hmm? Homework? We had homework? Oh, I, don't, I don't know homework. Homework? Of course we had homework, and of course you know. You're playing possum. You're pretending that you were sleeping and not knowing and not understanding, like, homework? I don't know homework. What, what homework? Playing possum. Next. Astronomy. Back up in the heavens we go. Venus. Ah, Venus in, this is very interesting now. We're gonna learn something very interesting. We call it sometimes the morning star because it's the last star visible in the morning. And we also call it the evening star because it's the first one visible in the evening. It's very bright. Now, why is Venus very bright? Hmm. Well, it's very close to Earth, relatively speaking. It's close to Earth. But there's another reason it's very bright. It's the, often the brightest star in the sky. In Korean, you call it gold star, gold star. And there's a very, very good reason for that. And we're gonna learn it today. Why is it the brightest star? Why is it gold star? Hmm. All right, let's see. Uh, number one, the first one. Uh, Beth says, is Earth the third planet? And the teacher says, you don't sound too sure of your answer. You don't sound too certain. Means the teacher's saying, I, I kind of was hoping you would know for sure. You know, not like, uh, is it Earth? I want you to, yes, it's Earth. I know, I'm sure, I'm certain. D, I'm very definite in my knowledge. She would prefer a more definite, a more certain, a more sure answer, a more sure uh, response. Notice again, you don't sound too sure of your answer means I wish you had a more definite response. Sure answer, definite response, synonyms, restatements. Number 15. Uh, well, things aren't what you seem, try again, All right? Try again means wrong. When a teacher says try again, that just means your answer is wrong. D, uh, C, not correct, not right, wrong answer, try again. Number 16, uh, come on, come on, we talked about this, come on. When a teacher says, come on, it's they're a little bit annoyed. They're not happy, they're a little disappointed in the student. Not because, you know, the st not because the student's wrong, it's just because the student should know this. Yeah, it's also because they're wrong. But I just taught you this. Are you not listening? Come on, come on, what's up, come on. Hey, that means the teacher is very, very annoyed because A, 16A, the students should know this. Come on, very common in English. Um, yeah, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Now. Uh, we have the word uh, centigrade, which means the same as Celsius. A lot of people will say centigrade. I, they're both correct. I usually say Celsius. Um, but anyway, when you hear centigrade, it means Celsius. 500 degrees ce centigrade. <clears throat> 500 degrees Celsius in the American measurement is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, It's basically you double it and then subtract 10%. Okay, so you, you double 500 to 1,000, uh, uh, subtract 10%, it's 900. That's rough, but that's pretty close. Number 17, uh, does anyone know? Why is Venus so hot? Could it be the atmosphere? Teachers do this all the time. They try to suggest, could it be mo mo mo? Suggestion, suggesting an answer B, number 17 B. Could it be is a suggestion. Number 18, I'm asking about the clouds around Venus. I want to know about the clouds around Venus. In other words, I want to know more. I want more information about the clouds around Venus. A, number 18 is A. Now, number 19, do you want, do you know, do you want to know what they're made of? They're made of carbon dioxide. No, no, wait a minute. There it is again, another mistake. Oh, no, wait a minute, oops. D, change my answer. They're made of carbon dioxide. No, wait a minute, no, no. I'm changing, 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 changing. They are made of sulfuric acid. Wait a minute. If they're made of sulfuric acid, what does that mean? That means the clouds have sulfur in them. Remember fool's gold? We learned about iron pyrite, and we learned that it looks like gold, 
because it contains iron and sulfur. And it looks like gold because sulfur is bright, bright yellow or even bright gold. Iron pyrite with the sulfur looks very bright. Come some, gold star, very bright. Why is it so bright? One, it's close in the sky. Two, the sulfuric acid is very yellowish and goldish in color. So when it reflects off the sun or the light of the sun or the moon, it's very, very, very bright, surrounded by this sulfuric acid. That's why Gumsang is a perfect name for it. Good work, very interesting. Let's move on. Speaker's stance. Stance means your position, your feeling, your opinion on something, right? A stance can be literally a standing position. Like uh, imagine a penalty kick in soccer, okay? Penalty kick, right? Uh, the goalie, the goaltender is, is ready for it, right? They're in a specific position waiting for the kick. That's the stance, the position. A batter in baseball, that's called batting stance, right? The standing position waiting for the pitch, okay? Stance, the position or the feeling or the opinion of the speaker. Okay, uh, go ahead and do the example and uh, do question one and two. Do it all together. As always, you can read the example while you listen and do number one and two. Go ahead. All right, number one, uh, do you enjoy playing chess? chess? Yes, I really do. Well, you might think about joining the chess club. I belong to it and I think you might really enjoy it too. Okay, the woman is really positive. I, uh, I belong to the club. I love the club. You might love it. You should join. Positive, positive, positive. Number one, B, she thinks it's wonderful. Positive words, positive voice. Listen to tone of voice. Tone of voice is very important uh, in these questions, like with uh, skill three, the function. Function and stance, you're listening again. Listen to the words, listen to the context, and listen to the tone of voice. Number two is actually more about the tone of voice. I, uh, uh, my chess playing uh, 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 might not be uh, quite up to, not high enough, not high enough level, not good enough. The tournament, uh, when somebody's, uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, they're very, very uncomfortable. A little bit nervous sounding. And his words also are very kind of uncomfortable with the idea of playing in a tournament. That's too serious for me. Playing for fun, okay, but a tournament, uh, see, I don't feel comfortable. And I don't sound comfortable talking about playing in the tournaments. Number two is C. As always, please read the introduction and the shaded box. Let's do some practice now together. Uh, consultation, uh, course load, page 152. Now, load is something you carry, like your backpack. You have a heavy load in your backpack. You're carrying a lot of books, maybe, or a lot of something, okay? Uh, course is load is how many courses are you carrying? Yeah, you don't carry your courses in a backpack. You take your courses. So how many courses are you taking in a semester? Right? If, you're, if you have five classes this semester, then your course load is five classes. Uh, or sometimes they use hours. You know, I have uh, 10 hours of classes this week. Same thing, kind of, as course load. Anyway, how much you're doing, how much you're taking, how much you're studying, that is your course load in a given semester. Let's do it. Go ahead, listen, come right back. How does the student seem to feel about taking the maximum number of courses? Okay. Uh, the professor says, I want to talk to you about the number of courses you're taking. And the student's like, I take five courses. I'm taking five. I'm taking five again next semester. It's the maximum number. So at their university, five is the maximum number. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, I want to work hard. I want to finish my degree. Blah, 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 blah. So she's very positive. She thinks B, it's the best thing to do. Okay, she's very positive. 
She likes taking the maximum. She wants to do it. She wants to finish. She wants to get into graduate school. Te Hakwan. B. Number two, how does the, the professor feel? The student feels very positive, but the professor is, uh, well, you're taking the maximum number of courses. I don't think you have enough time to put sufficient time and effort into each of your courses. Sufficient means enough. So he's saying, if you take too many classes, you'll be very busy. You can't put enough time in each class your grades will suffer. You'll get lower grades. That's not good. He's saying basically, take fewer classes, get higher grades. Give more time and energy and focus to each class. Number, uh, number two is C. Do better work in fewer classes. Lower course load, higher grades is more important, according to the advisor. Maybe he's right. C. Uh, next one, one more, a questionnaire. A questionnaire is a survey. Okay, it's another word for a survey. We have two students on campus talking together. Obviously, they're outside of the classroom and they're on campus in a park, sitting in the grass, talking about a questionnaire. Okay, go ahead. Now, right at the beginning, the woman says, this is an interesting assignment we have for psychology class. And the man says, interesting? When somebody repeats a word, it means they don't agree. Hey, that was a great, that was a fun movie. Fun? That was a really interesting book. Interesting? It means I don't agree. I disagree. It's gonna be a lot of work. So, how does the man seem to feel? It's gonna be a lot of work. <clears throat> a lot of work, a lot of effort, D. Number one, oh, sorry, number three is D. Okay, he's very negative. Uh, interesting, no, it's not interesting, it's hard work. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort. Uh, D, a man feels negatively. Now, number, ten, number four is the woman. How does the woman feel? She's like, what's so hard about it? What's so hard, it's not hard. What do you mean? What's so hard? It's not hard. We just make up a questionnaire. It'll be easy to find 50 people to fill out the questionnaire. We can do that in one afternoon. That actually sounds fun. Okay, positive, 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 positive. Fun, easy, interesting, not so hard. A, enjoyable. The woman is very positive. A is very positive, enjoyable. The man is very negative. D, a lot of work, a lot of effort. Opposites, each one is one of the questions. Always, always listen. Uh, listen to the, um, the tone of voice and the feeling. Now, when you listen in TOEFL, don't focus on feeling, right? Because there are other things, the, the main idea, the details, the key points. Don't focus on listening, uh, sorry, on uh, feeling, but be aware of it. Okay, be aware. As you're listening, just understand through the voice and through the words. Understand, oh, the, the man's pretty negative here. Yeah, and the woman's really positive. So just notice it and be aware because you will get questions like this. And that awareness helps you a lot when you get stance questions like this. Homework, passage three, Native American studies. And passage four, meteorology, hmm, hail. Interesting, we'll talk about that next week. So your homework is uh, two listening passages, page 154 and 155, and your reading homework. Your reading homework again, uh, page 61 to 65. Tell me, you must tell me your time for John Muir, only John Muir. Please don't say it took me one hour to do all my homework. No, I just want to know your time for the one passage, the review passage, John Muir. Okay, try to finish it in 20 minutes or less. Tell me your time. If you take more than 20 minutes, you must keep going and finish it. And you know, you're not going to fail or anything like that. You just need to tell me your time. I want to see how you're doing. All right, good work. That's it. Next week, midterm exam. Be ready. Be at your computer ready to go a few minutes before the midterm exam. Trust me, you want to be ready. Okay, the exam will be sent at the exact time that I told you. 
You will have a specific amount of time to send to finish it. Send me your answers, and then uh, of course I'll later on I'll tell you what your score was, and, and of course your attendance next week is just based on taking the test. If you take the test, you uh, you know you 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 were at class next week. Are the work that we uh, the homework from this this lecture we will review in two weeks. Okay, in uh, uh, next week is the exam, so week ten. Uh, is when we will get back to a regular lecture video and back to uh, reviewing the work and moving on in the textbook. All right, any questions at all, please add them into your email or send me another email. I'm always happy to get emails from you and answer your questions. Have a great week, everyone. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, hearing from you and uh, get ready for the, uh, the midterm test coming up soon. Bye, everyone. Take care.